Please join me in giving Vicki Henley a warm packet and club welcome. Thank you, John. I'm really thrilled to be here. I love Wichita. I was in Wichita quite a bit when I was with the Film Commission. So um, um, I know Wichita pretty well, and I, and I actually I, I absolutely love it. Love it. My, my um, career has been mostly promoting um, Kansas. Uh, all things Kansas. Um, one of the things I'm going to ask uh, this group today is to think about their origin story. So when I talk about my origin story, I do say I'm a fourth generation Kansan. And my mother's grandfather came to Kansas after the Civil War and got 40 acres uh, north of, uh, of Junction City in Clay County, um, uh, literally in, in 1868, right as I was down doing that. I never thought about what my dad's family did. The, the only thing my dad family did for my origin story was after serving in World War II in the Navy, he came to KU and married a sweet farm girl right off the, right off the farm. So, but I want you to think about your origin stories. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Kansas, I'm going to talk mostly about the Kansas Historical Society. Who here has been to the Capitol since its renovation? Okay, I encourage everybody to go to the Capitol and its reservation. You all know that we spent lots of money renovating the Capitol, uh, but one of the things that they put into the Capitol is a visitor center. And uh, the Kansas Historical Society, uh, I'm very proud to say, runs the visitor center and, and helps preserve the Capitol. So this is the Kansas Museum of History. Now, who here has been to the Kansas Museum of History? This is, this is shocking to me. This is your museum. This is your museum. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the museum and a little bit about the State Archives and what we do at the Kansas Historical Society. But this is your museum. Um, we have been around since 1875. And we started because newspaper men got together at their annual convention in Topeka. Two previous historical societies had tried to start and failed. And so these newspaper men who understood how important Bleeding Kansas was to the history of the United States, how unique that was, said we must preserve that. And so the, the mission of the Kansas Historical Society is to collect, preserve, and educate. And in all the different divisions they have, that's the main mission, is to collect, preserve, and educate our unique Kansas history. So we, we were both public and private uh, for 125 years. And in 2000, 2001, the legislature said, you're doing two functions here. So we're going to split up everybody who, who reports to the state. That's the vast majority of employees. And that executive director, who is now Jenny Chen, will report directly to the governor. So Jenny Chen is the executive director of the Kansas Historical Foundation, and she reports directly to whoever the governor is. And so we always say, we're Switzerland. We're bipartisan. We want to collect everybody's history. Um, but. What we do is uh, uh, we honor the past, and that's you, and that's your stories. That's why I want you to start thinking about your origin story, how you got to Kansas, why are you in Kansas, what has happened in Kansas that is influencing what's going to happen in Kansas. So we do th three basic things. We honor people, families, businesses, and leaders. We educate. We're a huge resource. Um, for K through 12 schools. Jenny Chen, when she was not the executive director, wrote, literally wrote the seventh grade textbook. It's called um, uh, The Kansas Journey. And uh, we sell it in the bookstore, and it's, it's a very popular book. And uh, um, it's currently being rewritten uh, because it's about 12 or 13 years old. So we also provide, I was speaking to someone earlier, we do homeschool Wednesdays. We have lots of resources for families, citizens, and, and research, researchers. And then we try to inspire citizenship. We try to inspire democracy, leadership, entrepreneurs, and work, work ethic. One of the stories we tell is about William Allen White, who was the oracle from Emporia. He had a national and international voice in the first part of the 20th century, and five presidents came and visited him in Emporia, Kansas. We think that's an important story to share with our, our children, to say that you can make it, even in the first part of the 20th century, you can make a difference here in Kansas. We have, um, in the Kansas Museum of History, we have a main gallery, which is about 20,000 square feet. And we have about 2,000 square feet, which is uh, special new exhibits. And we're about to open 
um, 105 counties, 105 stories. So what we did was the, the museum director went out to all 105 uh, historical societies and said, what are some important stories that you want told in this uh, special exhibit? So we're trying to get people um, from around the state to understand that while we're in Topeka, we represent the entire state of Kansas. We want to tell everybody's story, and we think there's every, every person's story um, across the state of Kansas. We even had a researcher two years ago come to Kansas, and he's doing his entire thesis from France, from Paris, France, on how, how come the Historical Society was gathering um, history from Western Kansas when they weren't there. That's his entire thesis because we did a good job of it. We, we cared about the entire state of Kansas. So, so we do like everybody's history. We want everybody's history. We think everybody's history is important. One of the things we're gonna be talking about uh, from Sedgwick County is Major Astro TV show. Who saw that? Okay, more people saw that than has been to the m museum. So that'll be one of the things that we talk about. And right now I'm gonna talk about three of my favorite artifacts in the Kansas Museum of History. And one of the biggest one is the Cyrus K. Holiday locomotive. Do you all know who Cyrus K. Holiday was? He was one of the creators of the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe Railroad. He also ensured that the, Topeka, the capital was in Topeka because he donated the land for where the capital was built. So, so Cyrus K. Holiday, um, this artifact was given to us. Um, uh, we were, I, I, I want to go back a little bit and say, we started out as a historical society in the, literally in a room in the Capitol. And then we moved to the Memorial Building, which was on that first picture in 1914. And we were in the Memorial Building until 1985. And in 1980, in the early 80s, um, some legislators realized that that property was prime real estate. And it was downtown, and the uh, historical society was outgrowing its room. And so meanwhile, someone had donated 80 acres with a Potawatomi Indian mission on it. So we moved, the legislature um, secured funding for a museum, the museum I showed you a little bit ago, to, uh, to be created on that 80 acres with the Potawatomi Indian, Indian mission. And one of the first artifacts that we put in the museum, we hadn't finished building the building, was we um, laid the track, they trucked the, uh, the train out there, we laid the track and we rolled it into the museum. But once they had rolled it into the museum, they realized it was facing the wrong way. So they had to roll it back out, get a crane, turn it around, and roll it back in. So the, so the Cyrus K. Holiday is our big wow for five, six, seven-year-olds, especially boys. They love the train. And here we have spent probably more than a million dollars refurbishing the train. So if you have not seen the Cyrus K. Holiday train, it's our largest artifact that's not a building in the Kansas Museum of History. And I, I invite you to come, come visit us. Who knows who this man is? John Brown, absolutely. One of our prized possessions is John Brown's Pike. And everybody know the history of John Brown? John Brown was originally from Ohio. Ohio. His sons came to Kansas because they saw opportunity here. They wanted to get their own land. They came during Bleeding Kansas. And John Brown came to Kansas, and he was a reverend, but he got radicalized in Kansas. He got absolutely radicalized in Kansas. And um, I know Arnold Schofield has been here and talked to you about Bleeding Kansas. Bleeding Kansas is a big deal. We were front headline news for weeks on end, especially in 1856 to 1858, people were getting killed. And John Brown was very controversial, and he in fact led a, a, a massacre that killed five men. So we have a, and then of course he went on to uh, Harper's Ferry and uh, tried to take over the um, uh, the arms unit. So we, we have uh, John Brown Pike, we have a lot of things from John Brown, but if you're talking to um, some people, he's a hero. If you're talking to other people, he's a killer. So one of our oldest interactive is, they, they have a list of all the five things that John Brown de did, and it's like, is he a hero or a terrorist? Every time I go into the museum, it's at a different place. Different people think different things about John Brown. But we have his pike, and we tell his story in the Bleeding uh, Kansas section of the Kansas History Museum. Um, another thing we have is, anybody know who this is? This is General Custard. He was at Riley, and he was at uh, uh, Hayes, and his wife, um, Elizabeth, everybody called her Libby, 
was very protective of her history, of his history. So she made sure that we had an, uh, an important artifact of his. So uh, we have uh, the, um, the, the boots of General Custard. This is a, also a prized possession of ours. And this is, everybody knows Ike Eisenhower, I, I certainly hope. But he designed this field um, jacket. They didn't have, they had full army uniforms. And before he came along, he was like, no, uh, generals need, need a field jacket. We need to be, be able to walk around. And so we have his field jacket. Um, I tell everybody that I think Eisenhower is more famous outside of Kansas than he is inside of Kansas. Um, if you've ever traveled to Europe and you go on the, on the two-story uh, red bus around London, they always stop and say, and here's a statue of Eisenhower. The same thing in, in uh, uh, Berlin. He is quoted on a, a very uh, famous sculpture in Berlin, and he has a statue in Paris. So, so um, uh, he's one of our favorite, is our favorite son um, <laughs> from the state of Kansas. Um, and then we, all, we get questions about all, all kinds of things. We have over 115,000 artifacts. So obviously not all of them are, all, are shown on location uh, in the museum. So we have a massive um, storage unit in the back. Here's again one of the things that we're going to show um, on, the, uh, uh, on the 105, 100, and 105 counties, 105 stories. Does everybody know the Dockham sit-in story? The Dockham sit-in was in 1958. It was one of the very first sit-ins from Afri African American students. It was the Rexall drugstore downtown, and uh, it was actually successful. So for three weeks in July of 1958, these students came in and sat down, and, they, and the Rexall uh, drugs across the state of Kansas um, integrated after that. This is what we don't have. This is, of course, Dorothy's slippers. So we don't have Dorothy's slippers, but we have everything else. Yes, sir? We have them in Kansas, though, don't we? No. I thought they were in the Underground Museum. No, not to my knowledge. No. Uh, now, they could be in private possession in the Underground That's Museum. The, yes. Uh, that, that, uh, and if that is true, I need to know about that. Uh huh. Great. Oh, excellent. But they're in private possession. Okay, so they're, they're not ours. Okay, that's fantastic. I didn't know that. That's fantastic. Well, Mary, Mary Madden, who runs the Museum and Education Division of the Kansas Historical Society, called up the Smithsonian's. These are the Smithsonian's. Said, We'd like to display them. And they said, no. <laughs> no. Um, a pair was stolen and just was found in the last uh, 12 months or so. So we don't have Dorothy's slippers, but we'd love to have Dorothy's slippers. Um, a large part of the Kansas Historical is the state archives. Has, is anybody a researcher here? A couple people. Um, you want to come and visit us if you haven't already. Um, we have a very impressive state archives. So early on, when we became the, the Historical Society, that was 1875. In 1879, we got our first funding. And the legislature said, you will be the keepers of Kansas history. And so we started getting. Uh, the governor's papers. So we have everybody's governor's papers. We have legislators' papers. We have um, uh, agency heads' papers, and um, we have literally miles and miles of of information in the in the back archives. This is the front reference uh, area. So these are. I when I walked up, John was like acid free. It's like yeah, acid free. We're about preservation. So acid makes things go away. And so we're all about acid-free, but the way we used to um, uh, preserve things was, you know, we'd have a, a book on Sedgwick County, and we'd take every article out of the newspaper in a given year and tape it into that book on Sedgwick County. Now, we still have those books, but they're gonna, they're gonna crumble eventually. So now we have everything digitally. But here's our, our front reference area, and here are some of our manuscripts. We have 500 photographs in our state archives. Um, and again, over a thousand, uh, a hundred thousand uh, different manuscripts. And so we have, there's, there's two aspects of state archives. There's the government records, and then there's uh, uh, manuscripts, photographs, private collections. And we rely heavily on donations. So we have a, a we have several diaries, uh, many, many, excuse me, diaries. We have diaries of women on the Santa Fe Trail. We have diaries of, of just everyday women just putting 
what's happening in their life every day into a diary. And so we have records that are pre-statehood. And um, it's quite impressive. We have all of the Supreme Court um, cases in our, our collection. So uh, uh, we just, we just um, uh, recently got Governor Collier's records. And a year ago, we got Governor Brownberg's records. Now, it was a lot easier to go through Collier's records, because he was only there a year, than it was to go through G Governor Brownberg's records. So we can't keep everything, because we don't have the space for everything. And in the, in the industry norm is that about 5% of anyone's papers have enduring value. So we have people who are trained in the industry, and they have to figure out what has enduring value. Because we keep these in co climate controlled um, storage units and you are paying for that. So we have to be very careful about what we're going to, to preserve. We're not going to preserve that there are donuts in the break room. We're just not going to preserve that. And so, and here's another big item that we had to figure out how to preserve. These are stacked up against the wall and they are the payroll for the Atchison, Topeka and the Santa Fe Railroad. And it was its own museum. And so when we received that, we had to figure out, and we did a lot of peer review, talked to a lot of people across the nation and internationally and said, well, what should we keep? We can't keep all of it. And so um, they very carefully uh, figured out what to cull and what to keep. And so the war years have been kept. Anything that happened nationally or internationally or locally in the state of Kansas, they kept those payroll records. So those are the Santa Fe uh, payroll records. Some of the largest collections that we have are uh, the newspaper collection, because it was, it was uh, newspaper people who started us. Santa Fe, we have the Santa Fe collection. We have the Menninger collection. I love to tell everybody that we have both Alf Landon's papers, because he was the governor of the state of Kansas, and we have Nancy Kassbaum's papers. And um, we have Nancy's. We didn't have to get Nancy's. She chose to give us her papers. And um, she personally loves the, the archives. That's the heart for her, for the Kansas Historical Society, uh, is the, um, the archives. She had a son who has passed away, but he wanted to do a, um, uh, a documentary on her. And they were really blown away about what kinds of things we could bring up to show him, both video and paper, about her life in the Senate. And so if you're going to do something about you know Kansas families, you have all of Alf Landon's records and you have all of Nancy Kassebaum uh, records in the state archives. So it's, it's, it's a treasure drove of records. We also have, this is the, this is hidden, this is cold storage, and in cold storage we have those things that are um, highly susceptible to, to deterioration. So we have a lot of films, and uh, the one thing in our collection that is most valued, I think, by every employee is the Constitution of the State of Kansas. Well, we have the original Constitution of the State of Kansas. I remember walking in there, and I wasn't with Jenny. Um, and when we go behind the scenes, we're very respectful of all the items. We're just stewards. We're just the current stewards of all this information and all this collection and, and preservation. And so we feel very strongly that it's our duty to do as, bet, bet, as good a job or better than our, our forebears upon us. So we went in, and, and the, the one time I wasn't with Jenny, one of our staff members said, hey, you want to look at the Constitution? And I was like, no, I want to be invited back, <laughs> back in here. Um, but for the first year, it was on display in the, in the basement of the Capitol. But we're very proud of, it, of, of uh, being the keepers of such important um, information, uh, being the, the Kansas Constitution. Here is Jenny Chen, who again runs the state agency, her very favorite, um, besides the Constitution, artifact in the state archives. This is a letter from a teenage boy in central Kansas writing to his legislator saying, I want to go to the Naval Institute in Annapolis or I want to go to Westport. Um, please give me that recommendation. I need a recommendation from my local senator, Bristow. And not up here, that's the first letter, but the second letter was about a week later, I haven't heard from you, sir, and I really want to go to uh, the Naval Academy or to West Point. And we have this pa papers because we have Bristow's papers. And that was, of course, um, Ike Eisenhower. And so when we take kids through and we show them these pieces of paper, his 19-year-old, very impatient 19-year-old, I want 
an appointment to Westport or Annapolis. Mm -hmm. And um, again, another one back there saying, I haven't, a week later, I haven't heard from you. And then uh, Bristow gives in, he says, I've decided to, to send you to, to West Point, but you've got to pass the test. But I need to know how long you've been in Kansas and um, uh, how old you are and those kinds of things. So we have them because we have Bristow's papers, because he was a state legislator. And, and we like to take that out to, uh, when seventh graders come to the museum and say, think about that for a minute, right? We have the interstate system because of Ike Eisenhower, because he was in World War I, and he, he got stuck in the mud. It's the 34th president from the 34th state, and he was the uh, command allied leader in World War II. If he had gone to Annapolis, would we have the interstate system? And what would Europe look like today? I mean, you need to think about that. These are big, big things. So this is a very prized possession in the, in the Kansas State Archives that we have. And uh, we'd like to show everybody and say, think about that for a minute. Um, here I like to talk about, does everybody know Travel Air? Cup, couple people. So again, let's talk about origin stories. And uh, we've been looking over our museum very carefully with a, with a very critical eye and, and figured out what's missing from, from our museum. Now we have a, a biplane hanging from our ce ceiling, a Longren, that was built in Topeka. But we have in this city a huge industry that we are not doing a very good job of telling that story. Now we have, um, We have journals, we have these are all online, Kansas history, so uh, there's lots and lots of journal articles, Kansas history journal articles on the aviation, in the state of, uh, aviation industry in the state of Kansas. But there's not, except for that Lundgren, which was built in Topeka, there's a huge gap of we need to tell the story. And so, again, the origin story for Wichita being the air capital of the world is Travel Air. Lloyd Stearman, Clyde Cessna, Walter Beach joined and created Travel Air in 1925. Now Travel Air only lasted until about, 20, until about 1929, but those three men went to go and create the air capital of the world, they really did. Lloyd Stearman went to California and brought back Boeing. So, so that's a very important story for us to be telling much better in the, in the Kansas Museum of History. I think you can find it online that's good and well, but we want our visitors coming to the museum to see it as well. Um, we have um, thousands and thousands of visitors that come to see us, but we were, we, before I was there, we were early adopters to the internet, and so we have several internet pages, web pages. We have, uh, oh, sorry, I'm jumping around too quick. Uh, just to finish up from the Santa Fe cars, um, here were Santa Fe cars moving airplane parts from Boeing in, in 1867. So all of these items that I'm showing you, our staff got from online. So we have these, uh, these uh, internet places online that, oh, and here again, another photo uh, for something very important. That was a few years before the sit-in. Do, do, do people recognize where that street is? That was, uh, that's the Duckham, that's where the sit-in is. It's, not, it's no longer there. Um, but it's a very important uh, uh, way before Greensboro, whatever. Um, and here's, here's, again, these are from Kansas Memory. Kansas Memory is an online uh, digital uh, 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 database of, of our artifacts that we have online. It was set up specific, specifically for K through 12 educators. Um, we think by teaching Kansas history we can teach critical thinking skills. And that's not teaching rote memory. We don't, don't want to teach rote memory. We want to teach these things happened, and then these things happened, and then these things happened. Just like I said, Eisenhower was in World War I and got stuck in the mud. As a major, he proposed the interstate system. As the president, he made it happen, right? We want kids to connect the dots, right? And so we think we can do that if we teach Kansas history in the, in the right way. And so we have this um, uh, Kansas memory. It has curriculum for teachers, K through 12 curriculum for teachers. And so it teach, we teach teachers how to teach Kansas history so that we can encourage critical, critical thinking in, in the state of Kansas. This is a, a picture on Kansas memory of the Ark River here in um, in Wichita. And then right down the area, has everybody been to the Fresh Air Baby Camp? 
again, a couple people, a couple history nuts over here. <laughs> um, uh, uh, for many years, it was a Girl Scout little house. Um, one of the things that the Kansas Historical Society does is it facilitates federal grants and tax credits. And so uh, the people, the people preserving this building, which was a very unique history. This is around the side Polo was coming out, and they figured out that these kids needed fresh air. So um, sometimes it was a little cold in there, but, but it, it saved, um, I think, many, many babies' lives. Um, and, and we helped um, with tax credits and, and grants. And so that is on the Kansas Register, and uh, hopefully when it's completely uh, renovated, it'll be on the National Register. Here's where I was getting to was Kansas newspapers. So one of the top collections that we have is the newspapers. We have, we have researchers from all over the world come to uh, uh, research in the state of Kansas because of our newspaper collection. When the newspaper men got together, they said this is a very unique thing that's just happened. Uh, Congress usually doesn't uh, give up its responsibility and let a state decide. Of course, there are many, many things that happened before uh, uh, Bleeding ha Kansas, uh, the Missouri Compromise, um, m many other things. But one of the big things was, of course, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And if you look up the top 100 um, documents in the history of the United States, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is still there, right? And so everyone thought that it's even. We have as many people who are against slavery as for slavery in the state, and we'll let the state decide. We think Kansas, Nebraska will come in as a free state, and we think Kansas will come in as a slave state because it's 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 near Missouri, right? And we'll let the we'll let the citizens decide, decide right? Well, um, that led to nearly 200 men and boys getting killed between 1854 and 1861 over this issue. That's when John Brown came to the state and got radicalized, and he literally killed slave owners. And so uh, the newspaper men got together in, in 1875 and said, send us all your newspapers. We want all your newspapers. And long before I came with the Historical Society, um, they, they had uh, uh, partnered with Ancestry.com and Newspapers.com. Now, Ancestry came to the Historical and said, we know you've done off-year um, census, so in 95 and 5 and 15 and 25, 1925, we know that Kansas has done census. We want those, we want your census. And Jenny was the head of the agency at the time, and she said, well, what do we get? You know, you're a for-profit industry. What do we get? This is for our citizens. And so Jenny was able to arrange and maintain to this day that if you go on through our portal, you have access to everything that um, Ancestry.com or Newspapers.com has digital, digitized. You as a Kansan have access to that. Um, then we started slowly but surely digitizing Kansas newspapers. We got a federal grant for it. We got a little extra money for that here and there. And then um, a year ago, they came to us and they said, you know, we'd geared up. We'd geared up for this private industry, and we want to keep our staff. And so um, we'll digitize all your nineteen pre-1923 newspapers um, if you'll let them leave the building, which caused a lot of heartburn because it was our original. The, everything's been um, uh, on microfilm. That's the way to, that's still the best preservation technique because we don't know about what the next iteration of computer is, but microfilm, if you have light and a, and a magnifying glass, you can read that microfilm, right? So it's still the best preservation for things we want to keep for a long, long time. And so after many, um, ha lots of hand-wringing and thinking about it, we, we sent it off. And um, what was going to take us 11 years, I think we've just finished. And last year we had 40 million people visit us through our partnership sites and our own site. 42 million people. Um, I was watching the news a few months ago. Nothing to do with Kansas, but the headline was from the Newton paper. It was a national headline, but they were getting a local perspective because our newspaper was online. Our pre-1920 newspaper was online. So if you have not been to newspapers.com or ancestry.com, you can go through our website, which is kshs.org, and you have access to it. And see why there are 42 million uh, electronic visitors to the Kansas Historical Society. Um, we are very rich and, and dense in our, in our collections. So 
basically what I've talked to you about so far today is that we have these three divisions. We have the Kansas Museum of History <coughs> and Education is com combined with that. And they try to teach Kansas students um, uh, standards. So we have lots of different specific tours. You come as a fourth grader and, and that we give you pre-curriculum uh, information and post-visit information and hopefully they're coming to the museum to learn a very specific, specific um, uh, standard. Um, before Jenny Chen, we didn't have, when I grew up in Kansas, we didn't have standards in, in Kansas history. It was de totally dependent on your teacher whether you got Kansas history education or not. You can still graduate from a university in the state of Kansas and teach Kansas history and have never taken a Kansas history course. So we are the go-to place to teach the teachers how to teach Kansas history. Um, but we also do many other things. So I talked about Museum of Education, then I talked about the State Archives and the IT, and that's making a huge impact. And the last division I want to talk about is Cultural Resources. Cultural Resources does several things. They have historic sites. Um, every time Jenny and I come to Wichita together, she's like, why didn't we get a manufacturing, an aviation manufacturing plant? when they were, you know, in the 20s or 30s or 40s, we need, we, that would have been a great historic site. So she laments that we don't have that site um, in Wichita, Kansas, because that would have been a really great site. But Cultural Resources has historic sites, there's 16 state historic sites across the state of Kansas, and the one we're missing here in Wichita is a manufa aviation manufacturing plant. Then we have um, archeology, span so that's federally funded. So what the archeologists do is, um, if they're building a road, it's why it's federally funding. And they come across uh, human, anything human, artifacts, whatever. Then the architect has to go out and say, yeah, this is 50 years old. Go ahead and build your, ro your road. Or, no, this is 200 years old. This is a Pawnee Indian uh, um, village that these people broke off from the regular Pawnees, and they wanted to, they wanted to trade on the Oregon Trail. So they may have moved away from Republic County, what was then Republic County, what is now Republic County. And they came to Topeka because they wanted to trade with everybody on the Santa Fe Trail. Santa Fe Trail, big, big story of, of, of Kansas. And so, um, so the archeologists go, and we got federal grants, and they mitigated the site. So we'll, again, one of the new things that we need to tell in the, in the museum is, what did we learn? What's the research that we learned for two years of mitigating that site? And now there's a bypass on Highway 24 for Fool's Camp. And so we also give out, we have a records advisory board. If you're all in government and you want to know what records you should be keeping, you need to call our agency. Um, we're the leaders in that. And so we give out, we give out historic preservation grants. We give out um, uh, uh, tax credits and, and the such. Um, this is what we're going to be doing here soon. Uh, Tobias site is in near Lyons in Rice County. We have a two-week field school with professional archaeologists and amateur archaeologists. For a really nominal fee, you can come for half a day, a day, or three or four days and, l and literally sit in the sun and <laughs> figure out who was here, um, you know, 600 years ago. So it's very exciting. We also ha we always have a professional uh, person who's going to do the study because we need to learn something from doing this. We're not doing this just for fun. We're doing this to learn something new. Um, so I, you know, when I started working for the historical society, I thought, oh, you know, slow pace. You know, no, history is happening every day, and we're learning things every day, and we're producing um, literature every day, and and we're learning about that. So this is going to be, be, and uh, you can learn more about it on our website. But uh, the Tobias site uh, uh, is the ancestors to the Wichita um, and affiliated tribes. So we're going to try to learn more about That's a state-owned site um, uh, uh, now. And I think the next one is my commercial. So I'm getting t towards the end. Yes, it is. If you went back in time, what would you find? If you looked into the future, what would you see? Not a point on the map or a collection of things. It would feel more like a story. One that unfolds over generations. One about strength. 
courage. And dreams. A story about people leading the way, not so they could go far, but so the next person could go even farther. A story about a belief that we are all amazing in our own way. Headed towards the same amazing future. Because we all come from the same amazing place. A place that we call Kansas. Please help us share this ongoing story for centuries to come by supporting the Kansas Museum of History. Um, <clears throat> about the first hundred times I saw that, I cried every time. <laughs> I just love that. Um, uh, I, you should be proud to be a Kansan, but this is a great state. We're a fantastic state. The one thing I forgot to mention to you is, you guys know where the Republican Party started? It was Abraham Lincoln, right? He came to Kansas. The Re Republicans were, were uh, against slavery. And so we have a big connection to the Republican Party, your, your group here. So you should be very, very proud to be Kansans for many, many reasons. Um, so in, yes? Yes, I just want to wrap, wrap up one thing. So. So I want you to know, leaving here, that the Kansas Historic Society State Agency, they collect, preserve, and uh, uh, educate. The, the foundation does the membership, so we want you all to be membership members, because your membership money goes to support the Historical Society. We do publications of Kansas history, this is what members get. We do, we're like, very much like a foundation for your university. So there's uh, Wichita State University and they have a foundation. So Jenny Chen, I think, and her people are like the university, Wichita State University, and I'm like the foundation. So I try to raise money um, uh, to do things that we can't do uh, because obviously they are a state agency and they have been cut drastically, but um, we do, they do good, good work. So those, that's the difference is, Jenny Chen is educational institution, preservation collection, and I'm the foundation, which is alumni and economic support for them. I'm happy, to, I'm very happy to have been here, and I'm happy to take some questions now. Thank you. Okay. Well, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to speak with our guests. Uh, we have about 14 minutes, and so we'll be around. We'll start with members first, and then we've got a couple of hands raised, one back here, and then it'll be up to you. Um, one of the reasons you probably can't get one of the old aircraft factories as well, part of your museum, they still exist. They've been consumed and surrounded by the existing plants. Yes. That uh, Travel Air building that you show is actually part of the Beechcraft buildings. Yeah. I've been in it, the walls are still there, still the same thing. Cessna's buildings out on Bonnie with the original buildings that the Clyde Cessna built. They then eventually built furniture in and mm -hmm. back to airplanes. Yeah. And same with uh, Stearman. The, it's the part of the B-29 uh, factory, which is now also the 737 factory. So they're all still there. We just haven't archived the fact that those walls still exist and have stories locked within them all. Right. Um, another thing I wanted to ask about, what's the effort in, in the course of aviation beyond the inside our borders, we had a lot of people that we showed one of the astronauts, um, Joe Engel, for example, Steve Hawley, um, are, they're somewhat archived in the uh, Hutchinson Cosmosphere. Was there an effort to cooperate with them to sort of recognize all the people that have gone from Kansas to made achievements in aviation? Well, let me, let me tell you that um, when you go into the museum right now, it's in chronological order, and we tell every story under the sun. Well, Jenny and all of the people that all across the state, she works very closely with all educators from all over. We have, they have, that group of people, of educators, have been able to, to figure out that there are eight Kansas themes in Kansas history that are unique to the state. So we want to do the entire museum with what is unique to Kansas. We just took out a Victorian cabinet 
Every museum you have goes to a Victorian cabinet. If we have a Victorian cabinet, what happened in that era that was unique to Kansas history? And we have a lot of those stories. William Allen White said if it's going to happen in this country, it's going to happen first in Kansas. And that's true. We have great stories to tell. So we're in the middle of reimagining what that looks like. I, I anticipate that we'll be telling all those stories. But one of the things we want to do is have a wall of, of Kansans. And they'll be the astronauts, but they'll also be the people in this room, you know? I told you to think about your origin story. We want your origin story. Um, I have a, a, a brochure out there that I've mailed to about 6,000 people, and one of them was Henry Block, right? He's still alive, h and Block. And it was a request to send us your origin stories, and his assistant mail, uh, emailed that his ancestors were in Leavenworth and they fed Abraham Lincoln. We didn't know that. So we want to tell those stories. Those are important stories. So think about your origin stories and think a little, that little ta that's on Instagram. You can find that on, on our Instagram account. We have a Facebook account, we have Instagram account, we have Twitter, we have all kinds of things. And um, our, our annual reports are online, my annual reports online, Jenny annual reports online. Um, Here's a copy of my annual report. Jenny doesn't print hers because the state doesn't give her any money to print hers. Um, but I, 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 I produce these for members and for donors and for prospect members uh, to, to show you how. When, we, when I first came to the Historic Society, we had about $250,000 in endowed funds, and now we have over $2 million. We're older than KU Endowment. They have a billion dollars. So that's the, that's the difference of intention. Um, I'm the only fundraiser that they've hired. Before they had organized people, organizers. Um, but, I, but my background is fundraising. So even though I've, I've done a tenfold increase, I want to do way more than that increase as well. Um, and I think Jenny knows that the, um, those things have been subsumed. Um, she, just, she just thinks it's a missing gap in the story. That's a really good story. And she thinks people would come and visit it. That, that's the only thing, so. We have a question right over here. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for coming and sharing with us. Uh, since you've had a little bit of background in the film, yes. uh, could you tell us a little bit about the, maybe some unique things about the relationship that Kansas has had with film and production of uh, pictures and so forth here in Kansas? Um, oh, I loved being with the Film Commission. I was there for um, 13 years. Um, it, was, it was part of the Department of Commerce. It was about economic development. Um, all told, uh, we brought in about $300 million in that 13-year span. So, well, I got out right at the right time because that's when reality TV started showing. Um, but we, our bread and butter was made for television movies and every once in a while we'd get a, a, a major television film. Of course, we had, um, we had uh, Mars Attacks here uh, in Wichita and they, they shot at Burns and a, and, and a, and a, a, a um, nursing home, um, they, they rebuilt a, a donut out in Burns, at Burns, I think it was Burns, and um, then, uh, so we shot all over. That, those were fun to do. Um, the, the, the thing that has been seen by most people are the uh, Sarah Plain and Talls. Um, that was a book that was actually set in Hayes, and they weren't necessarily going to come out and film in Kansas, but we had uh, the right locations and the right everything. When I was with the Film Commission, it was all about economic development because they spent over half of their budget on location. So we wanted big films to come out, but we also wanted the bread and butter films. So, and we've had very famous filmmakers. Do you know that um, we ha this just this week we have an uh, Academy Award nominated a writer, Kevin Wilmont, is in Wichita, is in Lawrence, Kansas. He teaches at KU, and he co-wrote uh, Black Klansman with Spike Lee, and he just got a nomination from from uh, the Academy Awards. So watch and see if Kevin gets it. So um, we've had a lot of filmmakers. Um, what jump started the industry was we had um, Microbe from Ark City. He came out early in the, in, in, in the beginning of filming on location, and uh, he did Murder Ordained in Emporia, then he came back and he did The Bird and Proof in Kansas City. So it was about relationship building um, and having the right crew members and, and the right locations uh, to come out here. I, I loved my work on the Film Commission, but that was 80-hour weeks when their film was in town. So I'm getting older. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for being here. My, my pleasure. 
year before last, KFRW had a tour of yes. this. And all of it was very fascinating, but I think the thing that drew my attention most was the actual floor material of the second floor of the spiral staircase. The glass. What, no, wait, no. The library is safe. Oh, yes. So can you just tell them it, it is a glass floor. You're walking on a glass floor. If you have never been to the Capitol, you need to go to the Capitol. You will feel proud to be a Kansan if you go to the Capitol. These mostly men thought, we're going to do big things in Kansas. They built a huge and wonderful um, Capitol. Every room, we do the tours, the free tours, um, and the money, and, and the foundation does the retail, so the money from the store in the capital goes to tour guides. Um, but that, and I've had a film in that, uh, in that library because it was so unique. Um, but yes, yeah, so you go up this really tight spiral care, uh, uh, staircase, and you're walking on panes of glass so that you can see the whole two, two stories. It's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. Go, go to the Capitol. If you've never been to the Capitol, go to the Capitol. Yes, I've really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm actually from St. Mary's, which is just a little bit down the street from Topeka. The question I have is that if some of us feel like we might have an artifact that you would be interested in, um, do we first contact somebody Yes. To let them know yes. that we have this and kind of discuss that. So we used to have three or four curators. We have one curator now, and his name is Blair Tarr. And you would contact just anybody. You could call the main line and say, I have X. And what Blair will do will say the provenance on whatever artifact it is that you have that you, you potentially want to donate uh, is very, very important. So if we have five cribs from 1923, we're probably not going to accept your crib from 1923 if it doesn't have Nancy Kassebaum in it or something like that, you know? So this, the story behind it is very important. But you would be surprised. 99.9% .9 of the artifacts that we have are donated. It's just been since uh, Wichita person, Hal Ross, donated that we have an acquisition fund that we can buy acquisitions. So please do call us. Please, um, um, if, if you have a death in the family and you're like, what are we going to do with that? Please call us. They'll come down. They'll go through it and say, yes, this is a missing link in our story. We need this. Or, no, thank you very much. We have three of those. Um, but once we accept it into the state system, it's very difficult to get it deaccessioned. Um, the governor has to appoint a board. Lots of citizens have to be on the board. It's, it's just not... Accepting it is easy. Getting rid of it is very, very difficult because it's state property. So, so um, we're very careful about what we're keeping at a certain humidity and temperature. But please think of us. Please think of us. Please. Yes. My name is Deborah Mahusky. My grandfather was an original test pilot and mechanic for the B-29 bomber. Wow. I actually got to fly it with him when I was young. We need your story. Yes. And I have some, I have his original mechanics manual and some other things. Uh, I have my business card here. If you yes, can I, yes, I, yes. I my grandfather have. died in 93, made sure I had as many things as were still left in Torneo and taken. Thank you. See, now that gives me shivers. I mean, I am so happy, and the staff will be so happy that we made that connection. Thank you so much. My vice president was a, I think it was a recruitment effort to populate the Kansas prior pre-Civil War for free state residents. Mm -hmm. My great grandfather came from Canada to Fort Scott, I think, because of that effort. He saw the travel brochure mm -hmm. in the state of Kansas or something like this. Who was out recruiting, or you know that? Recruiting? You know, it was the railroads. Right? It was the railroads. So um, uh, uh, the federal government gave the railroads land because they, they wanted the railroad to be built. Um, but they also needed them to, to make a little bit of money. So the railroads did a lot of publicity, come to Kansas. And, and um, you know, go online. They, they lied a lot. Um, but <laughs> they also told the truth a lot. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we have... Um, 
I, in that video, uh, we were, I was there the day they were shooting that video, and we had kind of a stick pony, and, and that was representing, you know, horses and cattle and that kind of stuff. And then we have a little horse from Lindsberg, and they were like, well, we're going to have a horse, we're going to take that out. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. That's about immigration to the state of Kansas. So all of those items in that commercial represented, you know, something very important about Kansas history, you know. Sprint started in Abilene, Kansas. The ha half of all of Sprint started in Abilene, Kansas, you know. We need to tell those stories. We need to be proud of those stories. Before you leave, you need to go in the next room, look out the window at the Ambassador Hotel, because that's where the Dock and Drug Store was that you were telling us about in your presence. I've, I've been there. I had a drink there with someone. It was fantastic. I have been there, and we're very well of it. We're very well aware of it. We have mem we have lots of people from Wichita on our board of directors that make sure we know those things. <laughs> were they good? Oh, great! One last question: Do you have an affiliation with the Smithsonian? Uh, yes and no. So um, they know who we are. We know who they are. Um, we did um, a site. Uh, 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 Nicodemus. We es excavated a site in Nicodemus. And they very much wanted uh, for the new African American Museum to put in um, uh, some of our artifacts. So we have lent them those artifacts from our, our archaeology training program in, in Nicodemus. So yeah, we work with, we, uh, the, the other thing I, I just can't leave without saying, one of our best uh, uh, artifacts in the museum is we have um, Civil War flags, and so we have the best collection in the nation of Civil War flags. We actually have the best collection of African American troops Civil War flags, and it's four. And so we lend those things out after a lot of insurance and a lot of, you know, uh, art people doing the traveling. We let we we do lend out um, artifacts to everybody else, but we have great collections. So please come and visit us. Join me in thanking Vicki Hamlin. Thank you.